Hi everybody, welcome to Boost Your Employability. This session is portable skills to take you anywhere. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, we're about to find out uh, because luckily we have Claire Kemsley joining us today on the session. Claire is a Managing Director for Marketing at Hayes. Hayes is a recruitment company and um, uh, they're a global organization uh, operating in 33 countries and six continents. They have 13,000 employees across those areas. And last year alone, they helped secure 320,000 jobs for, for people um, across, across those regions. So we're in a really good position to have, to have Claire joining us. Um, whenever I chat with Claire, I get excited because she's so passionate about marketing. Um, and naturally, she's really well placed to help us to understand a little bit more about what's going on across across the world of marketing in terms of recruitment. So I'm going to hand over to to Claire now, who's going to give uh, the uh, the rundown, and then we'll jump back in with some uh, questions at the end. Thank you, Johnny. Um, I'm Claire Kemsley, and as Johnny says, I'm the Economic Managing Director for Hayes Marketing. What I wanted to share with you today really is a little bit about the marketplace, as Johnny said the marketplace, what's happening, the type of roles that graduates or undergraduates or those you know who, who have left and started studying um, can be uh, aspiring towards as their first or second role in marketing. And then why, I guess, why we reduce the reports we do for our customers, because they're all about the current state of the marketing profession, how marketers feel and the future of the marketing profession and the impacts that are occurring at the moment, for example, AI, which is just one of them, and also, the continued investment in the digital space, the, the technical, the MarTech roles we call them, the MarTech stack, those more UX, UI orientated roles, the more technical skill sets that some of you might be interested in. So this market analysis gives you an idea of the volume of jobs registered by companies direct on websites across the UK in the last six months. You will hear a lot about the marketplace, about the economic situation, the cost of living crisis, what does the marketplace really look like? For marketers, it's very busy. And whilst it might look terribly London centric with that 24,000 number at the top, there are actually a huge amount of volume roles available across the UK. And you don't always find jobs that are registered. So these are jobs that have been registered by individual companies on site, mainly websites, of course. But what we find is there are a lot of information we gain from our customers talking through the years with them about the shift and shape of their own teams. And we create opportunities. So you, there are many, many jobs you might find throughout your career that you actually achieve and you don't always see them advertised because we have talked to someone about your skill sets. And at some stage, when appropriate in the shift and shape of their team or the purchase of new technology in their marketing teams, they come to us and say, we'd like to talk to you further about Sally or Johnny or Freddie or the candidates that you talked to us about over the last six months. So these are jobs you will see. This is the sheer volume, 90,000. But there are lots of what I call the unseen jobs. Also in the marketplace, you don't always see the short term contracts and temp jobs. So it's a much more buoyant marketplace than one might see just from this data. But if this is all you saw, then uh, you, you, you know, there should be a level of comfort that you are working in a profession that is still very buoyant and actively recruiting. So if you did um, graduate uh, with a business and marketing degree, what would the first job be that you'd be more likely to get? Well, job descriptions can be very brief. They can be very detailed. Um, in marketing, you'll probably notice there is a plethora of marketing titles. The job titles in marketing just become um, wider um, uh, and, and some of them um, more interesting um, than others. For example, you know, we've recruited for directors of um, web, uh, which would sound like a more technical role, which in fact is not what was marketing, it was front end web development, uh, director of um, internet efficiency, which is actually about customer acquisition. So don't be put off whenever you see a job title. Have a look at what the actual specification is and what the need and requirement is. This was actually a real job. Um, so this job did exist. It was a, a manufacturing business uh, based in Northern Ireland. And they were actually looking, as you can see, for a graduate. But what they really were interested in is some work experience. So if you have the opportunity to do some internships, please do. If you have the job opportunity to do some unpaid work, that's absolutely fine. Any work experience you can get that touches on the marketing function that you're interested in is super valuable. Now, you don't have to have work experience to get your first job either, but in this particular role, they were looking for somebody to come and join them with some work experience. Obviously, they want a proficiency in Microsoft Excel here, but there are so many different software systems. In fact, there are about 8,000 
different software systems for marketing around the world. So you're never going to know them all and you're never going to have an opportunity to try them all. But any experience you can get and evidence of any particular tech systems, particularly those pertinent to marketing, you know, HubSpot, uh, MailChimp, etc., is always valuable to make sure you show them. So this just gives you an idea of these ancient level jobs. They're fairly comprehensive. You get an opportunity in this particular type of role to touch lots of the points of marketing um, and thereafter maybe become more specialist or not. Maybe stay in this, this role, these roles where you have a wide uh, I, I suppose a wide um, opportunity to learn and understand the components that you've studied. So, and also just just to give you an idea, this salary um, was advertised at twenty to twenty four thousand. Uh, actually, I believe we filled the role at about twenty four. So it's a relatively good entrance level salary. Um, as I said, this particular role is based in Northern Ireland. Um, don't imagine that all jobs for you when you leave will be titled graduate. They're not. Often they'll be marketing exec or entry-level marketer, or maybe marketing specialist. As I say, it's the content of the job spec that matters. So if we dive into uh, some of the latest research that we've done here, as Johnny alluded to, the first piece I want to talk about is the UK salary and recruiting trends. It is interesting when it comes to understanding salary, but it's more interesting to see what the insights show. So if we talk through this one, um, what did we find out? What did the latest research show us? Well, the first thing is that there is still a huge skill shortage in the marketing profession. And as you can see from the data on this slide here, it's incredibly difficult to be able to have every single skill set that somebody wants when you go to uh, to be you're recruited into your first role or indeed your second role. Seventy percent of employers intend to hire staff over the next year. Seventy percent. I mean, that's a huge number. And it's a positive number, and this data here just refers to marketing. In our report, we cover about 17 or 18 different professions, and we can give you access to that report afterwards. So skill shortages um, are a real issue. And then if we dive deeper into what are those skills shortages, what are the ones that we need to be aware of? As you can see here, there are many, many skills that organisations are looking for. This data we gather from organisations that are looking to recruit. So this is, these are organisations in our survey who said well, we have struggled to recruit, as you can see from the previous slide. And these are the soft skills that are most needed by our business in the marketing function. Some of these you would expect. Obviously, people refer to marketing as being a very creative profession. Um, I think those who have had any experience of working in maybe uh, an internship, that coordinating well with others is really important. But what we need to be able to do is demonstrate that we have these skills or we need to demonstrate we have the ability to acquire these skills. Critical thinking is highly discussed at the moment, particularly in fact at the part of the more senior level in marketing. The ability to show and evidence critical thinking is very important. There's also something here that I'd like to point out. Flexibility and adaptability obviously is a very fast paced environment marketing. So again, that's a really key skill to have but not to be confused with the ability to adopt change. We have all had to show our flexibility and adaptability, as you probably have in your learning, as I have in recruitment, as marketeers have in their own profession, over the last three or four years, particularly post-pandemic, during and post-pandemic. But actually, I, I am quite flexible, I'm quite adaptable, but I really had to work on actually adopting change. For example, MS Teams. You know, we've used it as, uh, all the time, we use it now, we're using it today, we talk about training platforms all the time and virtual learning, but actually I, I have found that difficult to adopt. So I can show my flexibility and I can show that I'm adaptable because I'm using it today, but I have really had to work on adopting it as a really good purposeful tool for change. So I'm aware that I can show flexibility and adaptability, but I really need to also show how have I adopted some of this change. Communication and interpersonal skills are key because actually marketing should sit at the heart of every organisation. And therefore, the ability to be able to communicate and, and really interact on that interpersonal skill level is critical. You're going to be working in your roles with a huge amount of stakeholders. A lot of those will be financial people, they'll be legal people, they'll be people outside of your, average, your, your daily remit. But they will be the people you will need to influence. So influencing skills and the ability to communicate and to negotiate with those people that might not be in your world are very important. So if we move forward and look at what we're really talking about in marketing. So what are the top five most in-demand skills? 
for employers when it comes to soft skills, this is focused in marketing. So there we have it, communication and interpersonal skills, so important. Problem solving. I think problem solving is always a difficult one because I would imagine that we would all say I can solve a problem. I think again what it is, it's about evidencing this. What, what could you portray, what could you show, what could you talk about potentially on a CV or interview that really shows evidence of problem solving? Creativity, again, it's not, you know, in the past, marketing has been referred to as a colouring in department. It's been referred to as the um, felt tip fairies. Um, it's been referred to many things that absolutely do not encapsulate the importance, the complexity, um, and, the, uh, and the absolute nature of the marketing profession. But it is creative. But creativity is not just about making things look good. It's about innovation. And that's why it's really important. Again, if you've been involved in something that's been interviewed, that's been created, that's led to something really super exciting in an assignment you've done or, or in a practical, a practical, or as I say, maybe an internship, it's important to think about what that is. And as I say, this ability to adopt change. So we can adapt, we can show flexibility, but we need to be able to show that we can actually adopt it. And that can be quite challenging in fast paced environments, um, in particular organisations where there might be pressure on campaigns or where there might be new product launches consistently. We need to show somehow that we have that ability to adopt change. So if we look at some of the areas that we are going to be working within and some of those digital marketing areas that have come to the fore, this is where um, I use this actually with customers, I use this with candidates, I use it with clients to talk about where marketing sits and the impact of the, those expertise skill sets in marketing, oh, particularly over the last five to seven years. So as I alluded to, marketing should sit at the heart of any business. Marketing should be responsibly involved in that strategic planning and operations piece. And if it isn't, most businesses at some stage will struggle. If we, I call this the honeycomb, um, I know it isn't by the way, but that's what I call it. This was put together for me by a fantastic marketing director who used to work for the International Hotel Group. And she came to work for us on a contract for two years in Hayes to help us explore what our world should look like when it comes to using digital marketing expertise in our global business. And she put this together to try and explain to individuals such as myself, who are not marketeers by trade, the importance of what your job is how it sits and where it sits, and the key components if you're looking to invest in this new digital space. And as you can see, that analytics, website, content, social, online, and direct comms. What I do like about this, and you can use this when you're seeking uh, your first or second role in, in marketing yourselves, or even when you're compiling your CVs, how it fits together. So if you talk about content, what type of content are you talking about? Copyright or curation? or video or graphics. If you're talking about online media, is that SEM, SEO? Is that online media partnerships we're talking about? Is that affiliate partnerships? What are we talking about? So when I see a job that says online media experience, what am I actually trying to focus in on for that particular role? What might they want? So you can use this very simple honeycomb to help construct your CV, to look at areas you might be interested in, and we are focused on digital marketing just on this particular slide. This is not the be all and end all of your entire profession, of course, but it was just an idea of showing you how quickly over the last five to seven years, the world of marketing has changed due to technology and it will continue. When we're seeing far more roles with the UX there at the top, UX, UI, you know, the user experience, user research, far more roles around SEO, far more roles about CRM. And the, one of the biggest skills shortages at the moment is in fact analytics. And if we look forward at the next slide, we can see that actually at the heart of most roles that you will come into, what we call them primary roles, so the first role you might get in a marketing team, are heavily influenced by analytical skills. And that's whether it's content, whether it's actually data specific, whether it's email marketing or general marketing, social media or PP specialist, you can see that every role that we have in marketing will be influenced by and, and have a huge importance placed on our ability to understand analytics. And the bigger the um, organization, the more complex the customer base, the more important this becomes. So if we look at the, the next report we did, which I think you might find interesting too, I hope you do, because everyone is talking about artificial intelligence. I was lucky enough to go down to the Henley Management School, the Business Management School, a few weeks before Christmas. 
and work with about, I think about 75 fellows, uh, mainly fellows of the Chartered Institute of Marketing, talking about the impact of AI, why it's so important in marketing, what's fearful about it, what do we understand about it, what impact might it have? So what does the report include? So when we do these reports with our customers, we take a lot of data, and obviously, which is your world, we do a lot of research and then insight. The data, by the way, is worth nothing to us without the insight. So what did we discover? Well, we looked at AI in the workplace. This was across 17 different specialisms. What I've done in the next few slides is drilled down to what the marketing profession feel. But we looked at how what's predicted to impact the workplace, what are the top professions and roles expect to be impacted, and in the top six, marketing is one of those, in the top six professions across many, many different disciplines, they, they expect that to be impacted. Using AI tools in the workplace, who's using AI? Uh, skills shortage and how we adopt, again, that word, how do we adapt, but then how do we adopt AI in the workplace? So if we take a look at some of those really pertinent areas, we looked at these nine areas in in-depth, we asked these questions and we looked at the data. So AI in the workplace is positively viewed, but it's not fully trusted. These are the answers across 17 different specialisms. I'll break down them into marketing in a moment. Employees and employers are not sure of the impact on AI tasks. That's quite complicated because if we don't quite understand the impact on our own role um, and on the tasks we perform within that, it's very hard to upskill. Top professions expected to be impacted by AI. Obviously, we, we all know some of like call centers where they're now using bots, uh, chat bots to, to, to an automatic and responses. But as I say, marketing is actually in the, in the top six. Employee, employers are facing AI shortages. There is such a skill shortage in this area. Um, from a marketing perspective, we'll be looking at that data and a little piece, of course, artificial intelligence at the moment in marketing, most common people talk about, is used probably for generative content. And that's about the conversation. So, you know, ChatGPT, we use Bing in Hayes. Um, it's mainly used at the moment from a conversational perspective for generative content. In fact, it's been used in some organisations for many, many years. We just don't know that some of the um, activity we see is actually been generated by AI. The top soft skills employers think professionals should have to complement the use of AI. We'll have a look at that for marketing in a moment. But interestingly, most organisations are not yet using AI tools. And those uh, employees that, that, that have an organisation that are, they don't feel very well equipped to, to utilise them. So then we looked at, well, what are the top ways employees want their employers to help them upskill in AI tools and techniques? Because that's obviously very important. And then finally, where employees think organisations can focus to ensure that AI is successfully adopted. Again, that word adopt, adopted, adopted in their business. So what do marketeers really feel then about the world of AI? Should we fear or embrace? Now, you could look at this from a positive perspective and say 58% of the people that responded, and there was about 9,000 to this survey, I think, um, said it was 58% said we embrace it. It's great. But actually, what I look at is 32% are not sure and 10% fear it. So, in fact, you've got a workforce in marketing where 42% actually fear AI. And that is often always about not being skilled up, not understanding the impact on my role, and why I might be fearful is because I don't maybe understand it all perfectly acceptable reasons. So what do we think? What do we think is going to happen in the workplace marketers? So there's a positive number here that are currently using AI tools. But the, the, the concern really here, that's the 53%, is the 59%. Because here what we're saying in markets is we don't think that the place I'm in, the place I work, is helping me to prepare to use AI in the workplace. And that does actually, in, in obviously, impact on how we feel. So in that positive 58% I embrace it, if we're not feeling that we're being supported in preparing, that's also being upskilled, obviously, into using the tools that are going to come to my business, I'm going to be fearful or I'm going to be unsure. So if we then think about what the impact is going to be on our roles, this is the feedback we got from marketers in the workplace at the moment. So again, we can look at the big number, the 43%, and go, that's great. But actually, if we look at the negativity, the no impact and the unsure, there is a large amount of, of conversation in the marketing profession about what is going to happen, what, how will my job be impacted, and also how will my profession be impacted with AI. I don't think this is necessarily negative, by the way. I just think it's a really big conversation that marketing professions are having. And I presented this to these very senior marketeers 
at the Henley Business Management School. And most of the conversation was very positive. It was about, okay, so why are we negative or, or why don't we think there'll be an impact? What can we do to improve our knowledge? So it was a very positive conversation about the need to upskill. Um, but we had to look at the data and kind of get the insight from it to start with, which is what you do in marketing all the time, before we could then think about, well, okay, what's it? we understand what the insight is. So what are we gonna do? Now we've got that insight, how can we improve how marketers feel about AI and what can we do to show them what the positive impact on their job might be? So in this one slide, I guess we've encapsulated what the report showed us on how marketers can be supported. So again, we look at that 57% of marketers say their employee isn't helping them prepare for using AI. And yet the other data tells us there's a skill shortage. So we go back to um, the customers we work with, those marketers working, the marketing managers and say, look, we know where your challenges are. What we need to do is support you in training and trying to work with you to upskill your current employers so that they can adopt and adapt. On the right hand side, we've got um, reconfirmation really of where those soft skills gaps are at the moment. So again, if you're going to put yourselves forward for roles, if you're thinking about how you can stand out, it's thinking about how can I evidence. So 65% of employees in marketing are saying they have to have the ability to adopt change. They have to show the ability to learn and they have to show the ability to critically think. So this is super interesting for me. This is a real drill down to those initial skill sets, those top five, and now we're drilling down even further saying, actually, we need to be able to evidence somehow where we, um, our, our ability to adopt, to learn, and to show critical thinking skills. But what is super interesting is there are transferable skills. So I just wanted to, to, to spend a little bit of time on what they look like. This is data that we actually took from not our own research, but from LinkedIn. Uh, we work uh, very closely with LinkedIn. Uh, we do a lot of research with LinkedIn. And in the last year, we found that more than 45% of those hiring on LinkedIn, that's not just marketing, this is on LinkedIn itself, explicitly use skills data to fill their roles. And that was up 12% year on year. What that means is that they're explicitly looking for particular skills, and that's what they look for when they put their job roles up there. In the past year, as you can see, um, 380 million skills were added to members' profiles. That is a massive number. So that's saying that the 380 million skills members added to their profiles on LinkedIn, which obviously can then be found when people search on LinkedIn, which they do using licenses to recruit. And that's over 40% year on year. And as you can see there, we're also seeing that LinkedIn members add a certificate to their profiles at an accelerating rate. So this desire to keep learning, to improve, to adopt, adapt and show where we're at with our skills and learning is super important. So what can we do to show those power skills that sometimes we refer to them as? Um, and how do we show, show what they are? How do we understand what they are? And how do we show how transferable they are? Well, these are the four, what they say, the four most powerful skills. This is from the LinkedIn data uh, and their, their research that we, we uh, have used. So again, we can see problem solving, critical thinking, collaborative working, ad adaptability, adaptability here. So we need to show that we can we switch and move and be agile. In marketing, you'll often hear that phrase, agile working, which is really, uh, really um, talks about, uh, they talked about agile working in sprint, but it was just slightly different things. And the agile working I mean here is, can, can I move quickly in my given profession, in my given role? Can I, can I switch? Can I turn? Can I change? Can I, can I be available for new learning all at the same time? Um, agile working is, is another kind of sprint learning. Um, for example, you'd come across that if you were studying uh, your Prince 2 qualification. So if I understand the power skills then, what can I do to develop who I am and how I do things? And again, this is this is uh, taken off LinkedIn, which is a very valuable source actually for some, some learning. Um, so what I think is good about this is strength, weakness, opportunity, and threats. We've all done SWOT analysis of this type before. What I think is really good though is where they say what's helpful and what's harmful. So really, what's helpful? What do I do well? How do I look at myself and think? What do I do well? What are my skills? What sets me apart? I was talking with a lady um, from Google the other day, who's, who's their account director for their tech food business. And she, they have this amazing um, workshop called I Am Remarkable, uh, which is absolutely brilliant. And I was thinking about this when I read this thing, what sets me apart? Why am I remarkable? What's great about me? And the harmful negatives, but we do need to, to address these are actually, you know, what do I lack? Where can I improve? What holds me back? We don't have to share that with anybody. 
We just have to try and work through that ourselves so that we can then see, OK, so where are the opportunities and how can I shift myself into the strengths um, if, if I focus on where I need to learn? And what are the current trends? What do I know about the marketplace? AI is important. Uh, analytical skills are important. Understanding where marketing sits in an organisation. So who needs my skills? Who's recruiting at the moment? Where are the opportunities? And as I said um, earlier, we looked at that very exciting job um, map, you know, 90,000 vacancies. So where, who's recruiting? Where are they recruiting? And how can I prosper? Well, that means is how can I do well there? And if I get excited about those opportunities, what are my obstacles? Who is my competition? What can't I control? And I would urge you not to spend too much time on the weaknesses and threats, but just be aware, be self-aware and then really try and focus on those strengths and opportunities. What we've got that we can offer you as well alongside all of the learning you get with the CIM is something called My Learning. Um, we can send this deck to you, by the way, if you want it, but you can have the whole deck. But this slide is particularly interesting because it's free and it's a portal where you can sign up and you can access literally thousands. I think there's something like 3,600 marketing ones in here, but they, they range from very specific problem solving, um, SEO, PPC, through to leadership, through to critical thinking and learning. And what's important here is we know that we've just been talking about, for example, the need to, to be able to um, do critical thinking and problem solving. So you might just go on the platform and run this course. Some of them are 10, 15 minute courses, some are five hours. Um, at the end of these courses, um, you, depending on the course you choose, you do get a certificate, you get a confirmation, an award that you've set that course. So, for example, if you think, gosh, I can't show my critical thinking, I'm not sure what that means. Go and have a look at the critical thinking problem solving course. Uh, not only can you do the course and then add that to your CV, but you can then think about how can I show that now in my activities or how can I show that if I need to at an assessment day or an interview. So that's a bit of a half an hour whirlwind tour on what your world looks like in marketing at the moment. So um, back to you, Johnny. Happy to answer any questions or to elaborate if I can um, on any of those subjects. Brilliant. Thank you, Claire. Um, really insightful as ever. And um, we're getting lots of questions through. So clearly you've excited the, the, the audience too. Um, <clears throat> I'll just kick start with um, a couple of questions. And um, so we're, get, we're getting some um, questions around experience versus qualification. Um, so somebody who's asking, what um, do you think that getting a, a professional qualification, so whether that be a university degree or, or professional body qualification, is more important than work experience, or does that depend on on the job and the uh, and the employer? I think they complement each other. Um, work experience is important, um, it, it, and it's highly thought of. And as I said, it doesn't have to be paid. It doesn't have to be a whole year's internship. It doesn't have to be with a major organisation. Just any kind of examples of work experience you've done, whether it's you know being part of a, a marketing club and doing the social media for a marketing club at university. Um, but whatever it is, um, work experience is really important. However, I think equally, um, a commitment to studying for a qualification that is world renowned and that shows that you're serious about your future in marketing is equally important. So I wouldn't say one outweighs the other, but I, I do urge people who are studying uh, a qualification to get some work experience. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. And um, we know that um, work experience is really important. Employers ask for that. Um, I know from studies uh, with universities that um, less people are taking placements that, that, than ever. Um, there are different reasons for that, which we won't go into. But um, are there di different alternative ways uh, where people can acquire experience opposed to just doing something face to face because actually if those opportunities aren't available it needs to be um, acquired in a different way. Yeah I mean it's a cl classic example is a good few years ago I was presenting at a university and an individual in the audience said to me um, I want to be a travel, uh, a travel writer, uh, I want to write great content, I'd like to work for a travel organisation, I'd like to write great content, I, I'd like to do it from a sort of marketing perspective. And I've, tra I've travelled and I said, that's fantastic. And they said, I've been, they've been travelling six months. And I said, what did you blog? Well, I didn't. I said, okay, so what did you show on your Instagram or your social media? How did you share your experience? I didn't. And I said, well, all of that would have been experience, wouldn't it? If, if you've written a blog and shared that, and then you put some fantastic um, graphics or artwork on Instagram, that would have shown your commitment and seriousness to wanting to share 
as a writer of experience and travel. So it can be that simple. It can be, you know, you can use your own experiences. Um, I'm not suggesting that everyone who has a TikTok account is, go is going to be um, considered as, as, as a marketer who's got experience, but there are ways you can use um, the opportunities you have. If, as I say, if you're at university and you're a member of the rugby club, um, and then you become a committee member of the rugby club, and then you'd write all the communications. So you do all the communications before the games, you maybe write at the games afterwards. All of this, you know, that's content. All, 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 of, all of these things that we can do to show that we're very committed, and we're trying to find some work experience um, out of the norm of, yes, I must be working for a paid employer, um, or virtually, you know, sorry, or sat in an office. We're all used to working virtually now, we're all used to, to, to learning virtually. So you, you can do some really good, I mean, you know, if you want to, um, if you want to do broadcasting, you want to be a, you know, a, a journalist and, and move into marketing that way. A lot of people go into journalism, don't they, and move across to communications. So there's many different, you, know, you could maybe do, you, maybe you'd be doing some journalism for your um, university magazine or the Archie Club. Um, if you, you can use that as a transferable skill, the ability to write and communicate is brilliant. Um, it's just how you evidence that in your CV. Brilliant. I, I love that answer because actually it leads me on to another question that, that somebody was asking around um, increasing visibility. Um, both, um, so I'll ask it from two points. They were specifically asking how they increase visibility in a large organisation where they're looking for a promotion. So that's one part of the question. And then the second bit is how do you increase visibility just generally in terms of that shop window? So are there, are there specific platforms? that people should be using and I really like the idea of the blog but just wondering if there's any any expansion on that. Well I, th I think for example I would urge everybody who maybe wants to work in the, the sphere of public sector or commercial religion well, anyway um, have a LinkedIn account uh, and, and remember that the LinkedIn account you have is what the employer will see if they are searching online for example if we've just seen from LinkedIn data how many people upskilled that changed their skills, updated their skill sets on LinkedIn, for example. So have a LinkedIn profile, uh, but make sure it's the profile you want people to see. Equally on your social media, most people can access an Instagram account. Most people can access your basic Facebook, if indeed uh, anyone does that these days. Uh, most people can access your TikTok account to a degree. So just be aware of whatever you put out on social media is potentially what someone uh, employer in the future might actually see. And that's not to frighten them, it's just to say, you know, it, it is an example of, what, of, of who you are and what you do. do <laughs> Sorry, to answer that question, visibility and promotion, you know, if I want to promote in an organisation, the biggest thing you can do is ask. I'm not saying you can say, give me a job and they will, but what I'm saying is go to go to the person who's going to employ you in the future. If you want to go into a more MarTech job, uh, go to the data, head of data and say, this is the job I'm doing now. What do I need to show you? What do I need to learn so that I could be um, considered if an opportunity um, arises in your data analytics department? Be inquisitive. I have a fantastic friend called Bernie who uses the word curious. Be curious. Go and ask. In an organisation, I consider working with UX UI in the future. This is my background. This is what I'm doing in marketing now. What do I need to learn? And then go and utilise the, the CIM courses. Go and utilise any kind of um, the learning you can to show that you are willing to be flexible, that you are willing to, to move to a place where you might have to be adaptable. And of course, a lot of what we talked about today, show that you can adopt to change. So that's the, the, the promotion piece. Well, from a shop window, yeah, everything you do at, it, it is visible out there, isn't it, on the whole? I think if you want to um, focus on a particular sector, be, be involved, be engaged in that sector. If you want to work in, in the NHS, for example, research it, look at it, find it, the different organisational structures within it. If you want to work for a charity, who, why, what's your reasoning? Have a real sense of purpose and, and, and about what you want to do. If you want to go and work in a massive organisation, why? What can you show on your CV? And I would spec out, I would, I would approach businesses, don't wait to be found. Don't wait for people to find you. If you want to go and work for L'Oreal, apply to L'Oreal. It might be through a portal, it might be through assessment centres, but don't wait to be found. Go and, go, go and give yourself the opportunity to, to create a role uh, because of who you are. Brilliant. I, I love that because um, actually being curious allows you to understand whether actually you want to work for that organisation and whether your values and interests align. Um, sometimes we get preconceptions about where we want to work, but actually, yeah. um, until you really understand, it's um, it, it, it can be it can end in disaster. Um, you know, if you if you don't have the right kind of knowledge before you get into that space. Um, okay, brilliant. We're getting loads of questions around how people position their capabilities um, on, for example, a CV and a covering letter. So 
for, for my um, my sort of short to medium career, um, I, I, a two page CV has been the norm, plus a covering letter if they ask for that. Is that still a, a popular request? And what sort of ways do you think people need to be standing out uh, well, I think, in those? I think what I would say is is a lot of this was done by email, will not it? Um, uh, and attached documents, etc. So it needs to be uh, eye catching, but it needs to be succinct. So two pages max. Um, and what I would do is make sure that if you're doing covering letter that you you reference and evidence what is particularly relevant to that role. So, you know, if, if there are a particular um, skill set sought in that particular job specification, make sure you reference those um, and experience you know, to the particular role you're applying for. So don't just put all of your skill sets down. If they're asking for five specific skill sets and you can evidence those, firstly reference them. So reference the fact you have those top five skills. And then in the letter, somewhat briefly, I would try and evidence them. So you want to bring to life those achievements, those skills, those successes that are particularly relevant to that job. So, and I'm talking a few lines here. Um, so very succinct, but reference the skills and the experience of the particular role. So I, you know, the reason I'm applying for this job is bang, 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 because I've got these skill sets. Um, and then evidence. So then and these are the examples of um, where I have had, I have had achievements and success with these particular skill sets. So that would be the covering letter for me. And what I would do with the CV is keep it succinct. You know, a chunk at the top, um, a, a very brief paragraph, but you know, outlining your particular skill sets. Um, and, and relevant achievements, uh, and then brief, you know, brief job descriptions, job titles, maybe job descriptions. Um, and at your stage in career, uh, qualifications are, are relevant as, as you get on, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years in your career, it becomes more and more and more experience based, bar obviously a, a professional qualification. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, and it's a little unfair for us to say, go and get some work experience, but also at the same time, it's a challenge. Um, some people here are expressing they feel that it is a challenge to to get that work experience. Um, th there's lots of different ways, um, and Claire, please feel free to chip in here. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can you can gain work experience through industry projects. That there are also lots of um, platforms that um, and organisations that offer virtual work experience as well. So it's worth just just checking that on a on a search engine and seeing what comes up there because we know it can be a challenge to be in the right location to get face-to-face -face, um, work experience. And also it's, also, it's a challenge for the employer to take somebody on um, and it's a bit of a risk. Um, and this is a really kind of cost-effective, easy way to get experience uh, globally as well. So you could work for a global organization without having to relocate. Um, and that's, that's one way of doing that. And another great way is, um, competitions that people uh, put out there. There are lots of organisations that do competitions, um, whether that be for students who are at university or otherwise. So L'Oreal, I, I know, do a, do a big competition every year. Um, CIM, we, we do a competition every year called The Pitch, which is, um, we actually work with Hayes on that. And um, Claire, do you want to talk a little bit about, about The Pitch competition and how that works? Yeah, I mean, we're support that's a brilliant idea because we're, we're um, supporting the pitch com uh, competition this year. So it's um, open to all um, marketing um, members, uh, marketing graduates, members of CIM um, graduates, um, currently studying um, and postgrad in groups of two or three. And it's a real live project. Um, and it's uh, judged by marketing directors and uh, senior marketing comms directors in the commerce industry and the public sector. And then there's a big award ceremony and, and there are um, opportunities um, for those individuals to attend that award ceremony. So, but the most important thing about it is this year it's with a, a charity called Every Youth. So Hay support a charity called Every Youth, which is about finding um, homeless people um, somewhere to live. But Hayes' involvement is then trying to find them um, somewhere to work, of course, which is fantastic for everyone's um, dignity. So this year, um, Every Youth rebranded. They were called Youth Homelessness. Um, now they're called Every Youth, so they're trying to ensure that people understand exactly what their brand is, what their charity does. So the, the subject matter for the pitch this year is for groups of two or three marketers to go away and think about how can we really magnify the brand of Every Youth. I mean, what a brilliant competition from a sense of purpose, uh, which we should all really be thinking about from a sense of purpose. It's a brilliant cause, but also what a fantastic opportunity for groups of three or four uh, marketing students to come up with a genuine, um, genuine answer 
to an important question. And when that um, competition happens and the winner is announced, that that project will become real because every youth will take that project on and they will actively activate what it is that you have suggested. So it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, I think the closing date's passed for this year, but it's a fantastic opportunity for grads, uh, for um, interns, grads and postgrads to, to apply. So yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, be, we'll be supporting it again next year with another charity. But that's a wonderful way to show that your commitment to your studies, commitment to the real world, commitment to getting some work experience. You know, you're working on a real life project that will be presented to uh, the managing director and chairman of this charity, and then he will be involved. He and she will be involved in making the final decision. The winner. So, though you're absolutely right, those type of competitions seek them out um, because they're super interesting, they're super fun, and uh, add a really good, a really conversation piece uh, for your CV and when you're being interviewed. Brilliant, thank you, um, and thanks for that plug. Actually, that was that, that was perfect. And uh, you heard it here first. Hayes are going to be supporting <laughs> the next challenge. That's that's great. We'll be we'll be tapping you up after this about that, Claire. Um, okay, brilliant. Um, any, just just touching on that, um, some of you may have, have heard of the pitch and entered it this year. If if you have done that, there's an opportunity to um, basically use what you present in that in that competition to upskill and gain a, a professional marketing um, qualification with, with CIM. So if you've done that, please check out um, CIM um, web pages and, and find out how you can do that, or, or drop us a line to get get some more guidance on that because. It's a really quick and easy way to, to gain a professional qualification um, and you've already done the work. We are kind of getting to the point now where um, about upskilling uh, in, in particular. Um, so upskilling, um, people are asking essentially if upskilling is a necessity even when you've got a job. So even when you've landed a job, how is, is that something that should be considered going forwards or is just having the experience enough? Well, I think it's lifelong learning, isn't it? I, I, I think that if, if you stop learning, if you stop upskilling, then you'll get left behind eventually, um, particularly in marketing because of the influence of technology. So um, it's not a case of um, should I should I think about it? It's a case of why wouldn't you do it? Um, the new technology all the time. I'm not suggesting you should be doing training courses uh, every five minutes in your spare time. What I am suggesting is that you keep abreast of what's happening in your profession and your skill sets that are allied to that. So if AI is important, we know it is, and we know employers can't get the skills and employees don't feel they're being supported, find some learning. Um, whether that's an, an online course, whether that's a CIM qualification, or whether it's just going to talk to somebody in your business who does it and say, can I, get, you know, can I, can you mentor me? Can I learn? Can I, can I come and see how you do things? So I think lifelong learning is really important. And technology is moving at such a pace, and it's only ever going to get faster, not slower. And that, that the impact it has on marketing, on content writing, on front end web development, um, CRM, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you need to absolutely, I think, have it, have uh, yeah, yeah, be one step ahead. Um, and then it puts you ahead of, of those people who maybe aren't aren't focused on that. Yeah, love love that. And and, and part of Claire's um, presentation today around those transferable skills and transferable capabilities is because we've reached a point now where digitalization and AI uh, is informing where skills shortages lie. And um, all the, albeit digital technologies and, and AI are, are really uh, important and are gonna play a, a really important role going forwards. It means that some of those things are falling, falling away. So don't just think about the technical things. You know, you really need to start to think about how you can make an impact in a business but also um, when you're if you have the capability it's about being able to present that and communicate that in a, in a certain way and the best way to do that is practice and it's i know a lot of people don't enjoy public speaking and that kind of thing but that's a really great way to to sort of build up confidence in that space but you need to make the content relevant back to claire's point earlier about the fact that you have uh, an opportunity to, more than ever, to look at an organization and see what their values are, their missions are, and, and what type of um, people they, they recruit and, and read blogs and things like that. When you're applying for a job with an organization like that, you've got a really good opportunity to understand how they talk and what, what makes them, uh, what, what, what excites them. So you really do need to do that bit. And then there's also a little bit about the storytelling as well because lots of people are asking well how do i position myself you know maybe i've got the right capabilities maybe you have 
but actually storytelling and being able to communicate who you are and what you can do for that organization is, is really important because it's an investment for them. So they need to know why they would invest in you. And there's lots of free content on, on CIM web pages. And I don't know whether Hayes have anything as well, Claire, but storytelling is and creating that narrative and, and being a personal brand is, is, is something we take really seriously at CIM and hope to guide people um, with the content that we provide as well. Yeah, I think if, um, if you have a, a, a scout through the website, uh, we often have um, particular pieces on our um, that we put out on the LinkedIn or that brand about the importance of personal brand. If you go on to the My Learning, I'm sure there'll be something there too about, you know, branding myself. But I think, yeah, I think if you look through our website, there'll be quite a few, uh, have, have a play around with it. There'll be quite a few articles that you'll find um, on, on that personal brand bit. And as you say, it's um, it's really important because that's your world, isn't it? You know, brand is, is, is it overarches what your world is really. And so I think to be able to articulate um, who you are, and what you're doing, and, and the importance of the skills that you have and your ability to adapt and adopt and learn is really important. But storytelling is very important. Yeah, very important. In fact, over the last few years, we've actually seen, you know, job titles uh, uh, for, for storytellers. You know, we're looking for a storyteller. Um, I remember the first one I saw many, many years ago was for a charity and uh, they actually advertised for, you know, we want a great storyteller. Excellent. Yeah. Good advice. Um, so we're good. I'm going to move slightly away from the whole kind of CV, job finding skills, but because Claire did actually talk about AI as well and how that is impacting the marketing in industry. Somebody's asking a really good question here about um, do you envisage marketing being at the forefront of AI gen generative content, but also will consumers become tired of, of non-human language? Well, I'm not an expert on um, on generative content or AI, but I don't think it's going to take over the world. Um, my my opinion is uh, my my personal opinion is you know there's an element of we don't mind talking to a chat, but we don't mind knowing that as of what of, uh, some of what we consume is generative content. We don't mind that. That that's progress. AI is amazing, um, and will continue to change the world as a whole. But I think there will always be an element where we need to, to we are you, we are interesting in, in people, aren't we? We're interesting, complex human beings. And I think there'll always be a need for our input into great conversation and great storytelling and great content. So I'm not nervous of, of it, generative content. It's useful, it's brilliant, it's quick, it's hyper good sometimes. But I think there's always going to be an element of marketing needing to be at the forefront of what great communication is. And great communication um, is a whole host of things other than just generative content from AI. Yeah, and apologies. I, I realised that was a probably a, quite a techie question and, and no, a little bit unfair. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, we're, we're, we're all learning about uh, AI, uh, aren't we? So um, I think um, for me, some of the content that comes out of uh, generative AI is um, it, it can take that personal element away from it. So I understand the question, and it's about using it as a guidance and an and, and enabler and everybody gets bored of everything you know more vinyl records were bought than in the last 20 years a few years ago you know people are going back to traditional methods because that's just the way things go uh, fashion at the moment you know people are drawing on 90s influences so i think these things come in waves but the thing with ai is it'll continue to get better and eventually we probably won't know too much of a difference between what is human language and, and what ai language is but i feel as though we are a long way away from that at the moment. Okay, brilliant. Right, so um, lo lots of people are asking kind of uh, lots of questions about kind of um, getting individual support. Uh, sadly, we're not we're not able to, to do that um, today because it's it's quite a personal and time consuming um, thing to do. But you can see the QR codes on the on the screen here and you can feel free to connect with, with Claire or, or, or me um, and we'd be happy to have a chat and move those things forward. Obviously, Claire's the expert around um, recruitment and getting a, a job and, and we're able to serve that aspect. And, and I can help on anything regarding professional qualifications and, and training across marketing as well, or even future content as well for, for webinars. Um, so I am uh, I'm going to wrap up now. Um, thank you everybody for, for tuning in live and uh, as ever, we really appreciate the questions that come through because it helps to bring it to life. I hope everybody did learn at least one new thing in there. That's the aim of these sessions. 
but um, the last thing to do really is to say thank you very much to Claire. Um, it, really valuable to have your, your input there. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Claire. Love chatting with you as ever. And thank you everybody. Have a good rest of the day.